Welcome. Today we're talking with Saison Master Brewer, Yvonne DeBatz on Saison Yeasts. I'm Doug Piper, and I'm in Greenville, South Carolina in the USA. And I want to thank you for spending time with Yvonne and myself on for what's ours. It's for me, it's the afternoon, but uh, for Yvonne, I think it's pretty late, maybe about 1030 his time. So that's going to be really fun because what we hope today is to make your day a little more delicious, one sip at a time. Now, first thing, I want to give you an appreciation, uh, and, I, and I have to apologize, there is a mistake on it, which is, is terrible for Phil, <laughs> but everything else is right. I want to see, show you what Phil Markowski says about our speaker today. What he says is, no one I know has done more research into Saison history and brewing technique than Yvonne. I have great respect for him. And I am going to fix the typo in his name. <laughs> My apologies for that. Uh, so basically what I want to do is bring Yvonne on right quick, and we'll uh, just uh, speak just a brief moment. Yvonne, how are you? Hello, people. I'm fine. Hello, Doug. Good to be here. Thank well, you for the I'm interview. excited. To, you know, with accolades like that from Phil Markowski, I think we're all in for a really big evening. Thank you for doing this. Yeah, it puts a lot of pressures on my shoulders now, but thank you, Phil. <laughs> it's very kind of you. <laughs> <really. laughs> well, from what I hear, you can handle it well. Um, now, everybody in the chat, please write in there and, and let Yvonne know how much you appreciate him taking time in his evening. He's a really busy man. He's got a brasserie to run. He's brewing beer. And I know he was up late last night because we were exchanging emails well through the night. So he, he may even be lacking some sleep. So please show him some love there. Put it there in the chat. Also, to help me in future programming, because that's how we got on this Saison topic, is to please vote in the polls, because that shapes future programming. And that's a big help. So what I'd like to do is introduce Avon. He is the founder and head brewer, co-owner of Brasserie de la Seine. He studied at the Merle's Institute for Brewing and Malting Science, and he teaches the history of beer and brewing there. He's a beer writer, a lecturer, and he judges at not only the World Beer Cup, but GABF, the European Beer Star, the Beer Delano, the Dutch Beer Challenge, and the French Beer Challenge. Wow. <laughs> you are a busy guy, Yvonne. Yvonne, I've got a couple of things just to let the audience know about, so I'm going to come right back to you in just a second, if that's okay. I'm sorry, say that again. <laughs> I, I'm going to come right back. I'm going to cover a couple other things. with sure. So because we right. sometimes have full first-time viewers, and I think we have a number. These are our monthly free events, and we have subject matter experts like Yvonne that, that join us. It's actually our 69th free major events, and the only way they are free is through supporters that make that possible. I have people that help me, like Luke Pernodo helps me with copywriting. By the way, the typo is mine, not Luke's. Uh, and I also want to highlight somebody that's been a supporter of uh, Gourmet Brewing for some time, and I just really appreciate it. Uh, Clay Bunn has been a huge help in getting uh, Gourmet Brewing done. He's a longtime Gourmet Brewer, he's a member of the Brewers of Central Kentucky, the Bach Group. He's a BJCP competition coordinator and judge and award-winning home brewer with a three-vessel brewing system. And in addition to that, he's a beekeeper. So cheers, appreciate it, Clay. If you would like to be part of the solution to help fund these programs so we can keep getting great guests like Yvonne, please consider supporting me. At the Patreon link, that's down there at the bottom center of the screen. You can click on that and learn uh, where, if anywhere, that you fit in and can join the team and support these events by clicking on the bottom center. Uh, quick logistical items, click on the follow button in the upper right-hand corner. When I do pop-up events, and I'm going to be going to GABF and judging there and CBC, 
a lot of times I won't, I'll do unannounced events. If you are clicking the follow button, you'll know when those go live. Doesn't do anything else. You won't get spammed. You won't get any extra emails. That's all it does. You just get notifications like that when this event goes live. Refreshing your browser solves most technical issues. If your, your bandwidth is challenged, if you click on the lower right-hand corner, there's a gear symbol. Please share in the chat where you're from. Uh, submit questions in the Ask a Question field. Maybe right there, maybe the bottom of the screen about there. Uh, answer our brief polls. And thank you for those that choose auto-registration. That really helps streamline these events and get everybody on here. So when you're registering, always check that box. And don't hesitate to contact me because I do virtual speaking and real speaking opportunities and also do private events, including virtual ones. So we'd love to hear from you. Coming up, we have some great events. Uh, in September, as I mentioned, I'll be taking you with me to GABF. It's my first time there, uh, and I'm going to try and cover it as best I can, as long as Chris will let me video and interview as much as possible. Uh, I also would be at the CBC in Denver, which is the following week, and I'll be covering folks there. Now, a new announcement has not been publicized September 23rd. Lars Marius Garsel will be joining us, and we're going to be talking about ancient fears. And this is because that you've said that's the guy you want to hear from, and ancient beers is what you want to hear. So there's some really cool things uh, coming up. Jason Perkins from Allagash. Looking there at the polls, Jason is really up there in the polls and has been. Jason is, is going to be joining us also on the 30th. And Olivier de Klerk is going to be joining us sometime before the end of the year. Don't have a date on that one yet. So that's enough of all that stuff. Yvonne, I want to get you on the screen so we can jump into it and get into the real fun of this program. So we've had a series of Saison events, and we've talked to some really great folks. I mean, Phil Markowski, who we just saw that name. You and I were talking about Stephen Powell's earlier uh, we, we've talked to Gordon Chuck. I mean, we've had a number, but none of them have talked really about the yeast. Matter of fact, Stephen Powell's said in his Tank 7, he didn't technically use a Saison yeast. Mm -hmm. So what caused you learn. to dive into this and do 20 years of research? Actually, my research, research is more on the style in general, not especially yeast. But for me, yeast is, is the most important character in, in beer. It's more important than, than the brewer him, himself. Um, and uh, what brought me to, to think about that subject is that I, I, I very often see what I think is a mistake, partly a mistake among brewers, home brewers or professional brewers, is to believe that there are only a very few strains um, capable of making a true, a genuine uh, saison beer. Actually, I think the problem is coming from the yeast companies. Nothing wrong with them, but they have, let's say, taken some yeast from some bottles uh, of remaining saison beers in, in Belgium, or at least beers called saison by some Belgium brewers. Um, I, I say that on, on purpose. And they, they had to find a way to market those yeasts. And most of the time, they called it Saison something. And uh, the problem it created is that for many people, I think it's the only way for making a Saison. And that yeast becomes then like a sort of a magic powder. Like I will make any kind of word or do anything I want in, in, in my beer. I put that magic in it and boom, I will, I will get a Saison. I think first that it's a little bit more complicated than, than that because the saison style is actually more a family than a style because there are many, many, many possibilities for making a saison. But it doesn't mean that you can do anything um, with, with, with the style. It has to, to, to fill some, some requisites. You, you have some purposes behind that style of beer for historical reasons, actually. And if you go too far of the border, then I think you make a mistake and, and make that beer. It's probably a delicious beer. Just don't call it a, a saison. But so what, what I wanted to point out is the um, diversity of ways using different kind of yeast for making a, a genuine saison. 
And um, I think that, uh, yeah, me, as I said, me, many, many years can, can, can do the job if you keep the purposes in mind. So we can talk about the history of the style later if you want, but a saison should be first like in alcohol. It's at the very beginning, a beer that is meant to replace water and to hydrate hard workers on the fields. I know there is a lot of polemics about the origin of saisons in, in farms. Makes me laugh a little bit, we can talk about it, but it was really a replace and, and a, a funny replace and safe replacement to water. Um, so like in alcohol, it's important because if you are working hard under the sun uh, during summertime and you, you, you get you got a beer that is nine ABV, you probably die for, from it. So uh, it, it has to be light. Also, most of the beers in Belgium were light in alcohol anyway at the time because of a, a taxation system that um, um, led the brewers for making very light beers. You can talk about that also. Um, light in alcohol and, and refreshing. Uh, so it means that it's a beer that has to be well attenuated and all dry. Uh, we can discuss that also. The color was pale most of the time um, in the in the saisons of Eno and Wallonia uh, region, which is, by the way, the, the southern part of, of Belgium where the people speak uh, French for the ones who, who don't especially know. But those beers uh, uh, were pale in color and, and described li like that. Pale in color, it means either very pale if uh, the brewer would have used a lot of um, unmalted grains like wheat, spelt, oats, etc. You, you, you get a paler color most, term, most of the time with that. But uh, depending on the malting skills of the brewer, it can easily go up to dark amber. It, it is totally acceptable for, 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 for the styles. Um, the way the uh, silly saison. Uh, mm -hmm which uh, they were kind enough to send me, and we did a program, and, and theirs is uh, uh, pretty much a dark amber. Yeah, yeah, indeed. It's, it's, it might be really at the edge of, of the color, but uh, yeah, in some instances, um, it, it most probably that, that, that some saisons were that dark, um, actually. Um, something that is extremely difficult to define um, and that is at the same time very important for the style to me, is that it has to have a rustic character. But what does that mean? It's very hard to, to explain that to the people. It's more like a, a feeling about something that is not perfectly clean, um, I, I would say. Um, it's uh, it Originally, as I said, a long time ago, it was made in farms, and then it continued to be made in um, most of the time villages breweries, sometimes town breweries as well, but most of the time it was made in breweries not having the latest um, brewing techniques, uh, the, the fancier brewing equipment. And, and, and so it was in those conditions quite hard, uh, at least in the 19th century, it changed after, to make a beer absolutely clean like, like a lager, even at the time would have been. So that rusticity is for me something that is very important and uh, different ways to get there. You can play with raw materials, you can play with yeast as, as well to get that, that very um, character. Um, the saisons also were beers that were in the 19th century and before, definitely sour beers. They had a tart uh, flavor and a vinous character. That is something uh, that first was sought after by the people, by the consumer. It was called in the past the taste of the north and taste of the north, it means all Belgium, northern France and the south, southern um, Netherlands as well. From a sociological point of view, it's basically, uh, people have basically the same taste for, for beer in, in, that, in that broad region. And they wanted a beer with a certain tartness and, and a wine-like character. And, and, and at the time, that was brought by a, segre, a long secondary fermentation in wood, where I think, and I claim some some hope, but it's backed by scientists um, of the mid 20th century as well. Uh, I'm sure that Brettanomyces were present, present if not all the time, most of the time. And those yeast can bring those um, that wine-like wine character uh, sought after. 
Um, it could have been a spicy beer or not. Uh, so spices have been used for making saison. It's a sure thing. But another sure thing is that it was not used all the time. So it's, it's not a mandatory feature. It's just a possibility that is given to the brewers. Um, a sure thing is that uh, a fruit, whatever the fruit, has never been added to a saison. I've never, never seen any mention of that. And the use of fruits in Belgian brewing is something uh, that was extremely rare. We all know the fruits, uh, lambics, uh, the Morellen beer, so made with um, uh, cherries, uh, uh, raspberries have been used, grapes uh, sometimes also, but it was always for, for sarbis and certainly not for, for saison. Um, and overall, and this is a key feature of the style, don't forget it has to refresh um, hard workers, so it has to be refreshing and to be refreshing a beer has to be balanced and if it's if a beer is balanced it has a good drinkability and so keeping the need for balance um in mind is something that is key for me when when, when bringing a saison well, so ivan you've you've talked you mentioned rustic and mm -hmm. a, a word i've seen my audience throw around was wild mm -hmm. um and so that makes it sound like the way you describe it, that, that we're not talking a particular strain of yeast or not a single strain of yeast. No, certainly not. Or, or is it? No, no, no. It, it, it's, it's many, many strains that, that, that are possible. Um, for, and, and, and attention, when, when people speak about wild yeast, uh, I'm totally convinced that um, most of the saison brewers, I say most because there are traces of the mention of spontaneous fermentation being used for saison. So this this is something really wild, and it was not the norm. It was the exception, but it seemed it existed. Uh, there are written records about that. So most of the time, the main yeast, so the the primary fermentation yeast that was used by the saison brewers, was a leaven that was kept in the brewery, and so it's it, it, these are yeast that probably were wild someday in the in, in their history, but what was used by the brewers was a domesticated yeast. And yeast seem plural and most of the time sometimes with bacteria uh, also in, in, in that leaven. So it was not pure yeast for sure, but it was not totally wild because not totally spontaneous. It was something that was kept um, with, with different techniques uh, by, by, by those brewers. And um, and sometimes if they would have a problem, a big infection taking place, they would simply go to see the neighbor and and, and ask the neighbor for 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 uh, his, his yeast actually. And th this is something that was uh, culturally extremely important in, in ancient brewing, is to be nice and friendly with your neighbor, because sometimes you can have a problem, and if your neighbor brewer is not there for helping you, um, that they. Um, if I, it, I mean, it can it can really harm you very badly, and so there is that um, habit of always giving uh, your leaven to a neighbor in need because you know that someday you you will benefit from it yourself. Because oh, you really? Can, can I knew think. Lars Garsol talked about kvike and that it mm -hmm. was very common to share the kvike yeast uh, yeah, yeah. Um, up in northern Norway, oh, but yeah. that's common in in i think it, europe it's, it's, it's a common thing in all the brewing cultures of, of europe yeah for, for sure it's okay. uh, it's almost a condition for you to survive as a brewer because of course at the time they didn't know exactly what yeast was but they knew very well that there was no fermentation and no beer without that thing that was called yeast and and and, and so they knew how important it, it was they knew also that it was kind of of fragile and, and, and so a way to get uh, out of the problems is, is to, to have like an, a nice neighbor helping you. So I, I'm totally convinced that in every single brain culture in Europe, it was the norm. Totally confused. So it's not a single strain. There are multiple strains. And then it's, while it's not purely wild, uh, it is domesticated considerably. Same. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, somehow. And to, to, to go back to the, um, the, the saison 
commercially sold by by the by the yeast companies those days um it's obvious for me that those are true genuine saison yeast uh, and so of course you can use them for making a true saison no problem with that um one thing that uh proves also that there are there must be genuine ancient saison yeast is that they are uh, phenolic of flavors positive kind of yeasts and and, and we know um, that uh, those yeasts are typical uh, saccharomyces uh, that have been wild um, it, it's very typ typical um, typical cells mo most of the time a little bit smaller than than, than the classic gross yeast and and those are uh, both positive um, so uh, using those yeast is of course not a problem. There, there are genuine saison yeast, no issue. But it doesn't mean for me that all the yeast that have been used by saison brewers were those kind of strains. And maybe even not that all of them have been um, a puff positive. We just don't know. It's a, it's a possibility, but it's not at all sure. And what I can say as a sure thing is that, you know, with saison, like with many ancient styles and porter is a very good example um the, the, there are different periods um in history and and each period gives somehow a, diff, a different beer there are minimum three main periods for porter for saison there are minimum two main ones after before the first world war and after the first world war i can come, come back to to that but um i can tell you as a sure thing that um for the primary fermentation um, some brewers used many different strains of yeast from batch to batch i have here uh, this this book is um it's um, a logbook uh, that holds all the brewing records of a saison brewery in 1900 and on the on the sheets you can clearly see they write the origin of the um, of the yeast actually and you can uh, see that uh, one day for this batch they will use a yeast that is coming from Wallonia probably a neighbor a bigger brewery in the neighborhood it's a guess the next batch will be fermented I'm talking primary fermentation very important with a yeast coming from Flanders and then the third batch will be fermented with a yeast coming from Brussels with the name of the brewery um, and so it means that um, you have to think um, were, were these blended when they were finished? Sorry? Were they blended when they were finished or were they just no, no, different no, batches no, no. with different yeast? No, no, it's it's just different yeast. It means one thing to me and, and, and what I read in, in different books and what I was told by ancient brewers goes in the same direction is that it's very important um, for the old type or fashion kind of saison to make a clear distinction between two phases of fermentation. The primary fermentation for which the yeast doesn't seem to be extremely important the type of yeast i mean the strain and then the secondary uh, fermentation and each time the making of uh, keeping beer beer de garde saison whatsoever in, is mentioned in those old treatises there is a huge 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 focus made by the writer on the importance of the secondary fermentation and so for me, the key in the style of saison is to, to focus on, on the second part of the, 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 the fermentation. And so it means that you can start with a, with a yeast that is not uh, per itself, especially attenuated. It can, it can be uh, like 60, 70% attenuation. And by the way, in the, in the logbook of that brewery I told you about, the attenuation in primary is around 70%, 77 to 174, but not more than 74 but as a sure thing after the primary fermentation those beers were kept for months in wooden barrels and it's there that the secondary fermentation took place in barrels that were of course infected uh, we would say by wild yeast sometimes wild, wild bacteria depending on the, the the skills of the brewer about his hygiene practices and and then started the most important phase of the seasonal fermentation and I'm quite convinced, uh, again, I said it, uh, that Breton mices were almost uh, all the time involved. This is, this is really the, the key. But so it means that, that you have so many possibilities for, for, for starting 
your fermentation you can you can choose many different type of yeast both uh, positive both negative as well very attenuative uh, with a low attenuation depending on what yeast you will use for finishing the job actually and your yeast for finishing the job can be a diastheticus type of yeast like the saison yeasts um, are uh, most of them it can be a bretonomyces yeast and so on and so on so you, you have you have so many possibilities i think it's always a, a pity to feel obliged to restrain your, yourself because the, there is one advantage uh, for that beer is that again it's a family of beer so it offers you many many ways to get to, to get to get there i guess i didn't didn't anticipate the importance of the yeast you use in the secondary fermentation and that's the one you really focus on yeah i can tell you that uh, i have dozens of books um in which it's black written black on white that this is the most important phase um in making those beers and and they wanted that that phase to go the, the slowest possible without getting a stuck secondary fermentation of course but they insisted all the time on keeping the beer at the lowest possible temperature and 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 not trying to go too fast actually to to get a quality uh, beer Avon, it would be a mistake to be talking about saisons and not share one together. And sure. you had suggested a saison Dupont, mm -hmm. and so I'm going to pour that. I, I have the Belgium label, by the way. Oh, <laughs> yeah, <this one. laughs> I, I like yours better. Is yours a brown <laughs> bottle or a green bottle? Uh, brown, of course. Brown. Okay. Yeah. Well, their big bottles are green. It's interesting. The 750s are green and the small bottles are brown. Yeah, you know, I think, actually, I don't want to, to talk for colleagues, but I think the main reason, uh, especially back in the days, was the availability. Yeah. Uh, I, I was told that there are many theories about using a green bottle sometimes instead of a brown. As a brewer, I can tell you I always favor the brown ones because it oh, sure. gives a better weight. And I think Dupont thinks the same. But uh, well, I'm, if you don't mind, Yvonne, I'm going to pour this, and I will put my camera full screen. And sure. I would love for you just to describe this. And I hope some folks in our audience are having one. And I see John Mallet uh, from Bell's is Brewery is yeah. uh, apparently on so a cool. bus riding back from the GABF judging. So uh, cheers to you, wow. John. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So we will switch over to that, and I'm going to pour this as best I can. As you know, pouring a Cezanne, Cezanne Dupont is a little bit of a challenge, and Olivier has tried to train me the best he could, but it's, uh, it's a little bit of a challenge. So here we go. Give it a Belgium head, huh, Doug? Oh, it will. Usually I get too much of a Belgium head. Oh, okay. Ooh, I think that's going to finish up nice. Something like that. It's, it's, it's great. Oh, you're doing good. Right, actually. Yeah, perfect. Super. Hey. That, it's, it's practice. Yeah, yeah, I see that. There we go. Now, let's see if we can top it off just a little bit with the yeast. Wow. Yeah, talking about yeast, it's really the, the first thing that comes through when drinking any saison uh, beer, actually. They, they, they have their, their horse yeast, which is a really, really great yeast. But it's a yeast that has a, a, a very big character. It, it's, you can recognize it like miles away. And everybody using that yeast is somehow making a, a Dupont beer. Um, actually, it, it might not, not be a very versatile yeast because it, it's 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 uh, personality as is, is so strong. And of course, you've directly got the the phenolic uh, flavor, so 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 typical of, um, of of Dupont. They are they are very present, very uh, powerful. They take most of your nose. But behind, behind it, you have um, nice um, soft esters. I think 
um, um, those are given by the, the shape of the fermenters they use at Dupont. Um, for me, maybe you know that, but the, the geometry, the shape of the fermenters is something that is absolutely key. It's key for making every uh, kind of beer and saison is of course not exception uh, to that. So they're very, they're very shallow fermenters at, uh, at Dupont. We, we have the same kind of fermenters, with, but with a different shape at uh, De La Seine Brewery. Um, but basically they are wider than, than tall for what concerns the height of liquid, meaning beer that is in the, um, in the tank actually. And uh, the fact of not having um, a too high depth of, of beer, um, first off, uh, I think doesn't give any stress to your yeast. And I always say that the stress should be for the brewer and not for the yeast. But also it allows another kind of convection um, in the tank that will um, change the way the beer gets fermented and, and the speed of fermentation. And so there will be a, a different utilization of amino acid during fermentation. And long so story short, it will lead, in, in my opinion at least, to a better ratio between higher alcohols and, and esters. So, Yvonne, yeah. I, I want to interrupt you. So not only do we have John Mallet watching, it looks like we've got Lars Garsol uh, watching. Wow. And since cool. we're talking farmhouses, uh, I'm going to try and see if we can talk him on screen because I know he hasn't sure. been judging, I don't think. Not mm -hmm. a GABF anyway. So uh, Lars, type in the chat if you'll, you're willing to come on screen. Ha! <laughs> Easy there. All right. Hey, Lars Garshall, everybody. Just a moment. Hey, cool. Hi, Lars. Lars. Good, Good to see you. What's wrong? <laughs> oh, your mic. Oh, yeah, your mic is off. Yeah. I've, I've tried to toggle it on and off. Are you hearing us okay? Um, I can knock you off and you can try and get back on. You want to do that? Okay. Well, that's cool. <laughs> well, I bet Lars has got some good questions, probably much better than mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure the, he has a lot <laughs> as a sure thing and well, uh, by the way for the ones who would have not read his book yet please buy it read it it's it's a fantastic book um that will teach you so many things uh i was blown by by, by it it's a, it's a it's a masterpiece so yeah read it. okay there he is okay we have so many people on i have to find people in there so there we go okay i can speak <laughs> hey Lars. hi guys <laughs> welcome nice to finally meet you yvonne um, likewise and as i was saying uh, i'm a big fan of your work so congratulations well thank you we can uh, we can form a mutual admiration society <laughs> <laughs> well, Lars, it's been a while since we've done an event, but I was telling everybody we've got one coming up. So this is great that we get a chance to talk to you beforehand. But as you know, this one is about Cezanne yeast, and we were just talking about wild versus single strain. But I don't think what we've really touched on yet was temperature. And yeah. Yvonne, what do you think about temperature profiles, fermentation temperature profiles? There is a very easy answer to that. It's strain dependent. So that, that, that's the answer if you want, don't want to really talk about it, but it's true because it's totally strain dependent, of, of, of course. Um, what I think is that you have to put yourself way back in the days where temperature control uh, was very complicated, if, if any possible. But those beers were brewed during winter time. And, and, and of course, uh, that helps maintaining the temperature not going too high. But as we all know, even once the fermentation has started, even if the surroundings are, are, are quite cold, uh, the temperature can really go very high. So um, it seems totally normal to me to believe that way back in the days, the fermentation temperature was very high. 
uh, I'm sorry, I'm totally metric, so I'm talking into Celsius, um, but I'm talking about 30 Celsius plus uh, easily. A sure thing, though, is that with the time and, and, and the evolution of the, the bring knowledge and, and the, the, the young bring science, um, step by step, uh, all the scholars writing about making beer and, and making beer de garde um, try to recommend people to don't go too high in, in, in temperature. Um, and, and so I think both coexisted for decades and decades. Let's say that the origin, at the origin, it was probably quite warm. And then step by step, most of the brewers lowered a little bit the temperature, but not all of them, far from that. Um, you know, I, I told you about the, the first World War being like a key moment in the history of Saison. And I always say there is a pre, uh, there are pre-World War I Saisons and post-World War I, blah, blah. And it's true, but I can tell you as a sure thing that I've known myself still in the 1980s, uh, Saison breweries in Belgium still making Saison like they were made probably in the 19th century. So, so it's a very long evolution and not every brewery has, uh, has evolved at the same speed, uh, far, far from that. But, but, but as a sure thing, scholars at a certain point re recommended the brewers not to ferment too high. Some did it, some, some, some not. So it sounds like farmhouse ales in general, because I certainly know the Kavaik is fermented very warm. Uh, is there any farmhouse ales in that category that isn't fermented warm? Uh, John Mallet says 86. I, I need a granite uh, converter. <laughs> I that's, to find uh, one that's a one very one complicated one. question. Yes, but um, the normal across all of Northern Europe was to fermented body temperature, so 100 Fahrenheit. Uh, but there were, there were always exceptions, like for for anything that you want to talk about in farmhouse ale, there was always somebody doing something else. Uh, and there's actually a lot of accounts saying where people say things like uh, the temperature when you pitch should be so that you could keep your arm in it. So that's that's well above um, body temperature, but it, I mean, that doesn't mean it was above uh, body temperature while it was fermenting necessarily. There's probably a hard limit at 45 centigrade that you that you really can't go above. But uh, you know, I visited Sigmund and he pitches at 39, and I visited this woman in Russia, and I asked her what her pitch temperature is, and she says she doesn't know. <laughs> so I just wait for her to you know say, okay, now it's right, and I measure, and it's 39. It's the same. So is is 39? Typical Yvonne for saison yeast. I know you said it's strain dependent, but oh. yeah, yeah. Totally. By the way, thanks, John, for the instant conversion. John is a is a machine for for calculation. He's, he's, he's amazing. <laughs> um, it's it's it happens frequently. Uh, of course, what you need to to see if, if it's harmful for 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 your beer, and it it seems that for the fact he's it's not at all a problem the yeast is not impacted by, by very high temperature maybe maybe the 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 demand of the consumer or or, or the brewer is 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 not the same also i, I mean for a foam retention head retention uh, as as an example uh i think also that uh, some typical saison yeast like the dupont one uh can handle easily very high temperatures uh i would not play that way with all the strains of, of yeast it's, it's it's really a matter of trials and error and 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 how taste and and looks the the, the the finished product actually there is no fixed rule because it's it will totally be different from from yeast to yeast so people tell me that uh, dupont uh, ferment very warm is it true oh yeah it's uh it, it, it's definitely above 30 slash 30 c slash 86 f uh, for for sure. Keep in mind though that um, I think that this is maybe also less harmful because of the the shape of of the um, the fermentation tanks at um, at Dupont. Uh, there is certainly a, a positive thing happening with those shallow fermenters. 
I'm not sure that if you do that in a very narrow cylindrical tank, you don't get some issues. I, it's a guess. I, I have only shallow tanks, so I cannot compare with, with narrow tanks. I, I don't possess any, but I, I would I would pay attention to that as a short thing. Well, you were talking about secondary fermentation. Hmm. And so you really intrigued me there because I really always thought of brewing a Saison with a Saison yeast. Hmm. You're talking about it being more important in the secondary fermentation. So hmm. what temperatures range? I, again, I know it's strain dependent, but where do you uh, go I, there? The, the secondary fermentation would take place in a cellar. And and uh, the brewers would always try to to put it at the, the coldest cellar they, they they would have, and and Brettanomyces can handle that without with without without problem, uh, and and as I told you also with the the, um, the time the brewing scholars recommended the temperature to be lower as as well, so I would say but it's 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 a it's a broad range. Uh, between 10 Celsius and and maximum 18 Celsius, um, and I have to convert that. Uh, give me a sec. So, so cellar temperatures. 10 Celsius is 50 Fahrenheit, and 18 Celsius is 64. Um, but I, but I, I'm convinced that if a, if a brewer or farmer would have had uh, a cellar even colder, he would have been extremely happy with with, with, with that. So yeah, they're definitely cellar temperature, and and lower than the primary fermentation. Uh, the the the, the bring treatises insists heavily on that. Well, you you make saison fermentation sound more straightforward than I've I've never personally fermented a saison, but mm -hmm. but I'm going to now. <laughs> but I've always been intimidated by the dreaded stall. And this is a word I don't understand, so please uh, paraphrase it. Stall. Well, oh, it, it it stops fermenting it's really halfway stopped. through. Oh, stocking fermentation. You know what? I was told about that um, by a lot of commercial brewers and 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 a lot of um, uh, home brewers as well. And I have no clue. <laughs> I used once the the saison du pont yeast when I was a home brewer. And I had no problem, but it's 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 my only experience, life experience with, with, with that yeast actually. So so I don't know, but I, I I was told that it's typical for this very strain, and I don't know why. Uh, the, the, only the brewer can 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 answer. Um, I I think I I've, I've no clear answer for 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 that. I I really don't know. Uh, Bob, uh, Bob Sylvester one, and one, one he knows he. But honestly, it's it's a pure guess, and and so don't even listen to me. Um, it might also be related to the speed of fermentation uh, in the in the shallow fermenters, and maybe that strain of yeast needs something um, to to continue her work that she she won't find if it goes too fast. It, it's it's just a just a pure guess. I've no idea whatsoever. So ask Olivier, the, the brewer at Dupont. <laughs> well, it looks like the consensus in the chat is it may be primarily related to the Dupont strain. I'm sorry? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. In, in, in what I've heard. Um, but you know, again, when the people talk about saison yeast, they basically talk about three strains, Dupont, Blogie, and that is the same strain. Actually, the Blogie strain is the Dupont that they selected at a certain uh, phase of growth, uh, and they isolated it. Uh, and so it makes a small mutant of the, of the saison, but basically it's the same yeast. So let's say that's one yeast. And then there is the so-called French saison yeast from Thierrier, which funnily enough is coming from my brewing school here in Brussels, so it's not French at all. <laughs> Um, and the sad thing is that because I asked my professors, nobody knows the origin of that yeast. No, no, nobody. But it has perfect characteristics for for making a, a saison because it's phenolic positive. It's a, it's a diacetic,us it goes very far in fermentation, etc. But so we only talk basically about two yeasts, and so you cannot draw generalities. Uh, also in attenuation, fermentation temperature, and, and all the 
what is making a beer from using only two yeast you you, you know um and uh, this is also why i wanted to talk about the, the possible diversity uh the old kind of yeast you, you can use and and there is also a spirit that you can keep in a saison uh is to use what you are what you find locally uh i mean grains local grains in, in, in some places of italy they grow uh, ancient varieties of spelt or wheat, beautiful things that you don't find elsewhere, and and obviously that never were uh, present in Belgium. And and I've tasted some Italian saisons made with with those grains. They are beautiful and they are totally within the guidelines and within the the the, the style. E even if they could not have made in 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 Belgium, but but it does doesn't matter. And same goes for the yeast. Uh, I think that using five keys for making saison is something that totally makes sense actually and, and it opens so many doors and so so many possibilities um yeah it's it's totally totally possible uh, um, well, Vinny Cherluzzo mentioned tools. that when in his he uses an open fermenter for his saisons at least yeah, at Russian oh, River Vinny oh, yeah. Cherluzzo mm -hmm. and so if he's oh, yeah, using an open fermenter yeah, and then yeah. I know, uh, I don't know if Saison DuPonts are open, but I know theirs are square. What, what do yeah. you think about the fermenter shape? They, they, but that's, that's what I told you. They are, they are closed at, at, at DuPont, but open or closed, I think that's what matters is the geometry, the relation between, the ratio between height and, 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 and width. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I was saying. Uh, I, I don't know the exact reason for, for it. Uh, honestly, I should reread some textbooks for for giving a, a better answer to that. But I'm sure that it's it's related to the speed of fermentation that is a little bit lower in those shallow tanks. And and I, I know Vinny's tanks; they are some of the most beautiful I've ever seen. And and I'm not surprised that in those tanks that yeast there's no problem. I, I'm sure there is something to do with the geometry. Okay. Convection, so it is fermentation, etc. The intake of amino acids, etc., uh, etc. Et well, I think that kind of brings us to the Brett question. Mm -hmm. uh, that 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 seems to be a, a point of debate. Uh, I think in your mind it is not. But uh, can can you explain how best I guess to use Brett? to get a first-rate saison? Easy answer, strain dependence. <laughs> so it's the, same, it's the same thing. It, it, it totally, totally depends. Um, I think you should not pitch too much of them, but enough to get the real, the real character. And, and, but for me, the, what, what is important is to give the time to the, to the yeast to do our job and, and to, to get to the right flavor profile before releasing the beer uh, to, to, but, to the public. So what part of the Brett flavor profile are you describing? Because it really changes. Yeah, but all of them are good because it's obvious that back in the days, different strains of saisons were in different breweries. So there is no, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, no one strain of retinomyces that is better than than, than, than others. And um, you, you know, we we, we make a saison with bread called saison van de Brew. So it's um, prim primary fermentation made with our house yeast, which is both negative yeast because I don't especially like phenols in, in beer. It's a matter of, of taste. And then secondary fermentation with a bread that is not coming from the yeast bank, by the way, but from the wild in Brussels. We could isolate it and it's now kept in the, in, in the, in the laboratory for, for us, whatever. Um, when the beer is very young, it's, it's extremely fruity. It's a bread that gives a lot of pineapple, wonderful fruitiness. It's almost exotic. But then with the time of aging, you will, we, you will have more of, of the, the funky character, the barnyard, etc., etc. But it's... Uh, I, I like that beer in 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 both moments. Uh, I mean, some will say maybe it's it, it's more saisonesque uh, when it's totally barnyard. But uh, I'm sure that when those beers back in the days were served young, some could also impart some fruitiness from 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 the bread. It, again, I, I wasn't there, so it's it just a guess. But there is certainly no one 
perfect strain of bread for making a saison. I'm convinced that all of them can work. And it's a, it's a, it's a yeast that gives a lot of evolution in, in, in the flavor with the time. And so it totally depends on when you drink the beer and, and then when you like it the most. Um, it's that, that, that's truly a matter of taste. So give the time to your beer to reach the timing you like it the best. And so, so what is that timing, or is that again strain dependent? Uh, I, I mean, you know, barley wines, you know, can take years to really get to the characteristic that some people like my, that I like. My experience, uh, but again, it depends on the temperature um and 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 the strain but we have good results results that we like after 2.5 to three months but then you have a long evolution in in in, in flavor and uh and it it will really really change and maybe you will ask me which moment i prefer but it it, it depends on on the day of my mood <laughs> um really well what, what we do though uh is that uh we referment classically at converter 2325C, which is, give me a second, um, try to go faster than John, uh, 73 Fahrenheit for two weeks, classic Belgium uh, re-fermentation in bottle kind of temperature. But then we keep it at a lower temperature uh, at 15C, which is um, 59 Fahrenheit, whatever. Um, because I have the impression that it helps the, um, the flavor to stabilize more. So in our re-fermentation in bottle, there are two stages as well. The main one, two weeks, and then uh, at high temperature, then a long one, two to three months at lower temperature. We get a nice flavor stabilization. So Yvonne, as we begin to move into, I guess, the audience questions, but with, since we've got Lars here, mm -hmm. I think, uh, Lars might have some specific questions he would yeah. like to ask you. Uh, Lars, have you, have you got one you'd like to throw at Ev Yvonne? Um, I, have a, I have a few. Um, I wanted to comment on some of the things that Yvonne said initially. Um, it was interesting that he, uh, he said, or you, you said that Sesoin yeast is not wild but it's domesticated but it's you describe it as kind of semi-wild and that's interesting because it's a it's a beer two yeast which is uh as you know those are famously uh close to wine yeast and closer to the wild yeast than uh than yeah, the yeah. normal beer yeast mm -hmm. um yeah. totally makes sense huh? yeah it does yeah absolutely mm -hmm. um and this thing you said about sharing yeast as well i thought was very interesting because uh, particularly this example from the from the logbook was fascinating because uh, of course the farmers shared yeast with each other but we see the commercial breweries do it as well that um, yeah. until was, Hansen uh, in hmm? my experience sorry to interrupt it was a, a common thing even uh, among commercial breweries in Belgium until the 1980s since the 1990s it seemed to to stop almost and and nowadays yeah. it's not at all a common thing, but it, but it really used to to be. It was like a sort of a tradition uh, yeah. that went through the ages. Yeah, you see you see the the the, uh, the Danish lager breweries doing the same thing when they have problems with the yeast, mm. they all they all share with each other. Um, yeah. But uh, uh, there were a few things that you said about uh, the Brettanomyces that I thought was interesting. So um, in the craft beer and brewing interview, you say that um, you, were, you were convinced that the Brett lived in the, um, in the wood of the secondary fermenters. But, and that mm. makes me wonder, so how, how did they clean uh, these secondary fermenters? On, on a very simple way, most of those breweries at the time had no steam engine. Uh, so it was hot water and uh, and handwork. Um, they would mm. most of the time use um, a very basic kind of broom made with pieces of, of wood and just scrub it <laughs> the, the, right. the most they could with hot water. And it was nothing else like that. They, they had some tools also to, to scrub the yeast that is on the top of the, the staves, more difficult. You, you can't get there with your broom, for instance. So there are different right. 
course, huh? Um, but they're but, not uh, they're not filling the the vessel with hot water. It's sorry? not like it's filled to the top. Uh, they they might have do that uh, when the um, the barrels were not used for a certain time. Yeah. But yeah. to be fully honest with you, I'm not sure about that. I think they they would because then then otherwise wood would have dry and and then they would get problems probably. Yeah. Um, so that that that's a guess. Uh, it makes I sense though. But, but yeah. I, I yeah, it also makes sense to assume that they probably didn't sell them because. If you have a lot of bar barrels, that's a lot of water. Uh, but in mm. in in um, in what we see in Norway, for example, where we don't find any bread, mm. is that the 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 standard way of cleaning was to really fill the barrel with boiling water, and and mm. yeah. then you're going to kill the bread a good distance into the wood. Mm. Uh, but what yeah. you what you describe would then work in a different way, so that makes sense. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'm, I'm, I would be very curious to see if it kills all, all the breads because it depends on the, the width of the, the, the wood also, I, I guess. But yeah. it seems, you know, I, I've been working at, at Cantillon for for a few years, and there they have a machine for for cleaning. They they put steam, and I can tell you that <laughs> the breads are not killed at all. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so there really was a, there was a research paper I think from the wine industry that was shared, and mm. they showed that. Uh, steam does not kill uh, the bread very deep into the wood, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, uh, specifically if you if you fill it with boiling water, it's gonna it's gonna um, uh, make it hot so far into the wood that that's oh. that is gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. but I, I will but not I, steam. No, yeah. but I, I have some old books only on barrels. Uh, I will have a look um, because actually. I, I don't know if, if they were doing that. Uh, I have no clue. For for cleaning, I know, but I don't know how they would store the barrels. My, my thinking yeah. also is that they would always try to refill an empty barrel with wort or beer. Uh, yeah, because you, you don't want it to dry out and... and uh, ex ex exactly. Yeah. Uh, because even with, 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 with water, uh, when the water cools down, you can have mold and, and, and stuff. And also, if yes. you close it too tightly, you have a vacuum. You will have a vacuum. So maybe they never did that. I, 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 I don't know. I want, I want to be, to, to be honest. But the, the classical way would be to try to refill as soon as you can. To never to store yeah. an empty barrel. It's room that that you spend for no reason, and 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 you know that it can damage your your barrel. So why why are you doing it? And, yeah, I've I've asked people, uh, old people in Norway, about this, and they say that. Even if you, you know, in Norway, people brew it quite rarely. So they say that even if you uh, do everything you can to dry it out as soon as possible, there is mm. going to be mold and, and, and you just can't mm. avoid it. So yeah. uh, one people, one thing that uh, people keep telling me is that Cesson uh, Dupont are using uh, a yeast with multiple strains, but you said something about it being purified just after the war, I think. Uh, once again, I don't like to speak for all the fellow brewers. What I was told is that originally um, the, 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 the there is a selection that have been done in the 1950s. That 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 that's timing where a lot of when a lot of uh, selection have, have been done in the Trappist breweries are, are, as well for for some. Um, but they've done that at at, at Dupont. And I was told, if I remember well, that actually from multiple strains, three have been selected. Oh. Um, but honestly, uh, the guy who really knows is Olivier de Decker at Dupont. Uh, and maybe what I say is wrong. That's what I was told. Uh, it makes sense. But now what of this strain has been selected by the yeast companies um I, I i don't know yeah but that would be the same as with quake that you start with uncountable number of strains and then mm. the yeast labs pick one because it's uh it's very difficult for them to consistently grow a fixed ratio of the different strains yeah yeah yeah, yeah. nobody knows how to do it 
exactly it's, it's very difficult and um so yeah and 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 it it, it shows actually the, the big movement that started right after world war one um in um uh, selecting more and more the yeast uh, to a certain point for some birds it tended to using only one single strain or, or, or also um and it started after the first world war but for some breeze it took them ages or it never happened for some it was very quickly done but at the time they had the technique for for, for doing that and and, and some uh, of them what i what i heard is from researchers is that uh people or like belgian breweries some of them kept using multiple strains roughly until the 1980s and that that's when yes. it kind of ended. I know some and I was there for tasting those beers, so so I can tell you that's that's true. Yeah, yeah, as a, as a sure thing. Oh. Yeah, 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 totally. That that's why I was telling you in 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 back in those years, some brewers were still making a, a saison that someone in 1890, for instance, yeah. would have think totally normal for being in saison. I I I know that for 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 sure. I tasted some myself even older, and on a blind test, uh, they tasted like, like like a goose. Uh, and and that, that that was also a way of, of, of making saison would make um, a fresh beer that would, you would age at your brewery for a few months and then you would blend it uh, at a certain point with an old sour beer to get the, the, the desired flavor of the time, the famous taste of the north, so uh, tart and, and, and white like. Most of the time the saison uh, brewers would have made the sour beer by, the, by themselves and when they made that it was it's, it sounds a little bit disgusting, but it was quite typical in Belgium. Uh, the sour beer was actually the um, the half empty barrels coming back from clients, or even worse than that. But I, I, I don't want to talk about that because it doesn't give a good image of Belgium. Um, they would take that in in the brewery. They were obliged by law to do that. Actually, otherwise mm -hmm. they would get penalties. By the way, and of course in Belgium at the time you never throw something away. So they would clarify that that that, that beer most of, of the time on wooden chips. Uh, let it age, let let it turn totally sour. Uh, it was considered to be vaccinated, uh, they, they they said uh, then and they would use that super sour beer for making the blendings uh, before sending the beer to, to the customers so they would get that mm -hmm. wine like um, and tart uh, taste. Um, another way for them for making that, and that was less common, but Dupont West Records and I have records as well, they would simply buy the best available sorby of the time. And that was the Lambic of the, um, the Lambic Brewers. And so I still have invoices of Saison Brewers who, who, who bought Lambic from uh, bigger uh, Lambic breweries from, from Brussels for making their coupage in French, their, their, their blendings. This is what we, we've done, by the way, with, with our Saison de, de, de la Seine. So that's uh, that's a beer that I, well, once again, I, I, I wasn't there, but I'm, I'm quite convinced we are really approaching the, the kind of flavors that Saisons had uh, in the um, in the 19th century. Sorry for the pla product placement, but um, I'm quite happy with this beer. It's the second time we, we, we make it. And I, and I recently found um, a new source um, in, a, in a book um, written by a scientist and that literally says that saisons uh, tasted like a girls with more bitterness, actually. It's totally comparable uh, flavors. And, and that's exactly mm -hmm. what, what you have here. Why um, a bitter version of a girls? Because it's, um, it was very uh, common and normal for the, for the beer de garde keeping beer, saison beers makers to, to put way more hops because they knew very well and especially in their environment that it would be quite difficult to keep the beer um, without the beer getting badly infected. And so they were using what everybody knew that more hops means more stability in, in, in the beer. But then the secondary fermentation underwent with Brettanomyces, sometimes bacteria, and then a blending with a sour beer. And the, the the end product is a beer that that has some characteristics of, of a goose, but with more bitterness because it was heavily hopped uh, at the beginning. It it almost seems like we could or we should have kind of organized this around secondary fermentation, because it's an aspect we haven't even talked about. Yeah, yeah, it's true. It's it's very important. Of course, this this counts for the pre First World War like saisons. 
once they started to select the yeast, the, the secondary fermentation was a, a classic lagering with temperatures depending on the, on the breweries. I think that a lot of them didn't lager too cold though. And, 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 and uh, I, I know for sure that uh, a temperature of uh, 15 C in, in, in lagering, uh, which is uh, 59 uh, Fahrenheit was not uncommon at all. So not, 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 not too cold in that, in, in that case. But, but, but that's basically what you can do for any ale you, you want to make today. I mean, there is nothing really special about that. So the secondary is the key for the, the, um, the saisons and, and, and the broader family of Beer de Garde uh, back in the days, say in the 19th century and, and probably before. Well, Yvonne, we're at the a little past the bottom of the hour, and I'd like to transition to the questions the audience has asked. Uh, but before we do, I'll, I'll ask Lars if he had one last question he wanted to work in before we uh, move into the audience sure. questions. And I know one of them that is in the audience that Lars has talked about. The number one question we have coming up comes from Johan Renner, and he's talking about creating that beautiful head found, found in the De La Céline beers and in Belgian Saisons. So I know, sorry. Lars, you had some questions about carbonation. So oh, yeah. do those two tie together? Um, maybe in a way they do. Uh, before we get to that, I wanted to, to just comment on what Ivan said about uh, this, this practice uh, that he described as disgusting and uh, defending the, the uh, reputation can, of Belgian beer. My, my, my experience with farmhouse brewing is that People did a lot of stuff that uh, t when you tried it and you just read it, it sounds absolutely disgusting. And then every time you actually get to try it, it turns out that it works. You know, they, they weren't stupid. They were doing things that work. Uh, I, I, I do totally agree with you. And as a general rule, the, the ancient people, not only brewers, they, they didn't know the why of the things, but they knew very well the how. Of the things and i yeah, admire exactly. them for, for that and it's in all the fields and I, I i see that every day when i read those those ancient books no no i was because now <laughs> i'm obliged to give you the nasty details it can be disgusting not to take back uh alpha barrel of a beer that was probably good and and and, and turn a little bit vinegar that's that's the cool thing but they was they were also obliged to take back you know if somebody drinks almost a full glass and then leaves a, a little bit with his saliva in it and stuff mm -hmm. or sometimes you had like buckets in the cafes and the people could like spit it and, and and you know and sometimes and i've read that all that crap went into the barrel that had to go back to the brewer and so that, that's the nasty part of it just just taking back half a barrel or a third of a barrel that's cool no problem with that but sometimes but it, we, we, we hear that, that from, had uh, we hear that beer was made Norway as well sorry it, it, it very... Isn't that isn't that made from <laughs> yeah, yeah, chewing yeah. corn? We reinvent, reinvented chicha, but the enzymes <laughs> did, did do their job already before they didn't send that, that part. And in French, that the 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 name of, of that return beer to be returned has a very nasty name that, that says a lot of, on how the people considered it. It's called Le Ramassi. And Ramassi, it's it's impossible to translate that into english but i can tell you it's it's not a nice thing <laughs> so whatever and well and, and, and remember the water was even was way more disgusting so i mean <laughs> no it depends you, you know they, they were all along rivers with flowing water or wells or also springs no i don't the the birds they were most of the time specialists for water they they, they, they knew what what good water was i i think of course, sometimes there must have been problems with hey, it's bored at some point, so no big deal. <laughs> well, are we ready to move on to our first question? All right. Well, Lars, uh, I, I guess you're gone. Uh, I appreciate you uh, jumping in here. That was fun. I, I never expected that, Yvonne. <laughs> but we never know who's going to show up. Mm -hmm. But well, let's move into our first question. Um, 
Can Johan you Renner, as I said, has the first question, and we've touched on that. So I'll read the question. Could you give us any advice to create that beautiful head found in the De La Seine beers and in other Belgian saisons? And as a side question, how important was foam and carbonation in the early days of bottled saisons? Got it. About the heads, it's, it's, it's kind of easy for me. Good molds, enough hops, and basically that, that's it. Fermentation temperatures that are not going too high, at least with my strain uh, of, of, of yeast. It's the basics. It's very, it's not, doesn't seem complicated to, to, to me. And it's an important feature for, for most of the Belgian beers, but also the way you pour the beer, we, we, we like good head. For the saisons, though, it's a very interesting question because once again, uh, it depends on where uh, you stop in, in, the, in the line of history. And as a sure thing, in the very early days, the saisons were not highly carbonated. And some of them, and I was told that by old people, they were sometimes served almost flat or, or really totally flat. Um, reason is that uh, they were kept uh, in wood. And, and so um, most of the time, all, all the CO2 escaped. And in the, the early days, when they were sent to the people on the field or some somewhere else, it was not uh, especially always sent in, in um, we call them expeditions, expedition barrels um, in French, which translate to barrels to be sent to the end cost com customer. Those ones had very uh, wet um, uh, staves and they could hold a certain pressure. And so a secondary fermentation was, was performed, well, third fermentation in this case was performed to give some carbonation in, in, in the beer. But sometimes when, when sent on, on the fields, they would just take a jug or any kind of bottle they, they, they would have and just serve it like, like that, like, like a lambic almost fat and bring it to, 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 the, to the people. But with the time, and, and that is, it seems started earlier than I thought my, myself, uh, probably um, early in the, the 1900s, um, some of the, the, um, the saison farmer brewers, they started to send their beer to cafes, to, 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 to pubs. And it seems uh, that uh, from then, uh, because it was sent to those cafes in those barrels holding pressure I told you about, and then later, uh, way later in, uh, in bottles, then the secondary fermentation could uh, play its role and um, keep in mind that it was a secondary fermentation with different bugs, including Brettanomyces and, uh, and diastaticus yeast. And so it's those kind of, fem of, of fermentation and then re-fermentation can go quite far with attenuation. And so it's not surprising that sometimes uh, you had a very high carbonation in those beers. But again, for me, believing and claiming that it's now mandatory to have a very high carbonation in a season. For me, it's a mistake because it happened, it's sure. Was it sought after by the consumers? I'm not sure. And, and, and to a certain extent, you can accept it, but when it goes too high, you have zero drinkability in your, in your beer. Uh, there is nothing worse for me to impart drinkability than a beer that is too highly carbonated. And, and your season should be highly drinkable. So there is, for me, nothing that is... And, and no fruit. No, no fruit, of course. <laughs> <laughs> no, for sure. And no fruit. No. And no so, black <laughs> So without getting too far away, going back to the beautiful head, and of course, uh, the Saison DuPont has one of the largest <laughs> of the Saisons I ever pour. Mm. Uh, you attribute that to what ingredients primarily? Again, good malt and, and, and enough hops. And, 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 and if you, you work some um, grains like, like spelt and, and wheat and, and so on, it will even increase the quality of the, of the foam. But um, yeah, maybe taking the time to, to make your beer, selecting your ingredients. Um, if it's not rocket science to, to, to me, it's not, uh, I'm always asked the question, I, I never know exactly what to answer. Especially, yeah, uh, selecting your raw materials carefully. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that that's important about a lot of things. So, Johan, thank you for asking that great question. Bob uh, Sylvester. So, sorry, because there is also something else. Um, is that especially if it comes from American brewers, that we are not using the same type of molds mo most of the time. And um, I think that the most, I'm not sure of that, but I think that the most used in the US are more modified than what we do. And we play also with temperatures. Not every Belgian brewer does that, but most of us do. We do, the pond does. And, and, and so um, you, you want to reach the right um, steps uh, for, for getting uh, the, the right proteins for having good head. That, that plays a, a huge role. So may, maybe uh, try with a classic European mold and, 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 and do the right steps and, and it will work. Run DMC is looking for a clarification. He's saying unmalted wheat, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, as a sure thing, well, in my knowledge, there, there's been only one beer in Belgium that did contain malted wheat, and that is the Grisette from the Indo region. Uh, wheat was almost as common as barley in Belgium brewing. Uh, it was a big specificity of, uh, of, of Belgium beers back, back in the days. You could find, I should calculate that more seriously, but I would say roughly that in 80 to 85, probably 85% of the Belgian beers back in the days, you would find wheat. At, at some point, there was always uh, uh, also a, a beer from Antwerp called Lorge d'Anvers, so it means barley, Antwerp uh, Even in that beer called barley, there was some wheat, small amounts, but wheat w was there. And so, for all of those beers, wheat was unknown, except for for the visit. So, when uh, Saison Brewer would have used wheat for his Saison. Uh, it, it, it would have been a malt. I'm, I'm, I'm totally sure. Um, if you use malted malt, you don't need to malt the, the wheat. Wheat is, is more expensive uh, also, and malting yeah. is an expensive, expensive process. So honestly, if you can avoid that, and, and you are uh, a farmer or a small brewer, of course you avoid that. Uh, and, and, and everybody does it anyway. So no reason for mal malting your, your wheat then. So let's, let's switch to Bob's question. So Bob Sylvester asked the second most popular question. Could you touch on fermenter geometry and why you prefer shorter, wider fermenters? And George Mason has added to the question, are there any saisons fermented in conicals? They must be. Oh, yeah, and actually they, they are. Um, but it will have an influence on, on the flavor profile. So the reason why I like wider fermenters, first, because I love to listen to old people and absolutely 100% of the old brewers I've met who could make different trials because they were there in 1960s or, or later and at some and they started, of course, with, with very wide fermenters, quite flat, and then some cylindroconicals came in the brewery and they made experiments um, making the same beer in two different tanks. They all told me that the beer made in the shallow tank was way better and that they never succeeded into finding the, the wheat flavor of, of their, their beers. And, and for me, okay, it's maybe people saying something, but for me that comes. Um, most of the modern brewers I know, and, and, and you have two wonderful ones, more than that, in the audience tonight and hello guys um, who also made th that experience uh, say the same thing so there is definitely something the truth is that it has not been um, well studied so so far one of the reasons in my opinion is that um, for making those kind of studies you need money and the people who pay for studies most of the time it's the big pros they all use very tall um, huge uh, thanks. So what would they pay for that? Um, something very interesting, though, is that I was told, again, uh, verify that, but I was told by different sources that even the giant Anakin, who was one of the ones who went the higher with the so-called Apollo tanks, 30 meters high, which is like big, big building, high, they, they, they went down and that they have no fermenter for the main fermentation 
going more than um, three meters high, uh, actually. Um, do, there is a reason <laughs> behind that as, as a sure thing, but it's not well documented. And I'm now in contact with a scientist I know um, who will maybe start uh, a study on that because there, there, is, there are many things to be, I think, discovered or rediscovered. Um, what, what, there are two things that are important. I think the pressure on the yeast is important to the profile of the beer. There are many studies now I know, uh, books are there, that show that the, the, the burst yeast can, can handle super high pressures. Um, but I'm still convinced that too much pressure can really have an influence on the flavor profile and the, the way yeast, the yeast behaves and the way that's the hippie me talking the way the, the yeast feels. I, actually, I'm totally convinced on, on, on that. Um, and so my maximum is two meter high, two, two point one, two point two meter um, high for that. Um, it seems, but this is not well documented, uh, that from 0 0.3 bar pressure, which is three meter height of liquid, something seemed to happen to the yeast. But I've seen that in one book, I will be fully honest with you, and there is no reference to another study, so I have to find out why do scientists, very high level German scientists talk about that. I, I, I have to find out with the help of the, the other scientists I know. So this is, this is really a part of it that should be more uh, studied and maybe there is zero influence and it's all bullshit. I don't know, but I feel there is something uh, out there. Um, one thing that you is know, it makes sure, it makes you know, total sense. I'm a scuba diver, and you know, you get down down to the pressures, everything changes, and it's yeah, yeah, you know can be dangerous if you don't handle it well. So it's no doubt other organisms are going to suffer from the same things. I agree, and it's not because something is not killing you uh, that, that, that you don't get touched by it or armed by it or, or it doesn't change you. So, but well, we, we will see. One sure thing though, and this is way more documented, is that in the very um, narrow and, and tall tanks, um, you have a huge convection within the tank due to the CO2. Um, and, and so this leads to uh, somehow better contact between the yeast and all the nutrient, nutrients, but it seems that it's going too far and it speeds up the fermentations, uh, which, something, which is something that is never great, uh, I, I think. But in, in the, the final result, uh, it will totally change the ratio between higher alcohols and, and, and esters. So in very tall narrow tanks, you have a lot of higher alcohols and too little esters. In shallow tanks, this ratio goes like this. And this, for me, this very ratio is, for me at least, the key to balancing beer, hence to drinkability uh, in beer. And I know I'm not the only brewer to, to believe that. And it has been, that, that ratio has been demonstrated scientifically so that this is not a hippie thing uh, we, we know. No, I will never claim that you cannot make a good beer in a, in, in a classic CCV. There are many fantastic beers that are made there. My, my beers could probably not because it would not be my beers no more. The, the flavor profile would be too different. Uh, and maybe that some some beers go better in those tanks. Some yeast strains suffer less, blah, blah, blah. But it's a very personal thing. And I know that we are a few brewers thinking the same. I don't know if you saw the ratios that Vini gave for his tanks. They are one-on-one, -on -one, yeah. which for me is absolutely perfect. Um, and um, I know that John's favorite beers are also made in, in more shallow tanks. Um, do, do, those guys know their job. <laughs> you, you know, it, it's, it's uh, well, it, there is it makes something. so much sense. Uh, well, Bob, that was a fantastic question. So it sounds like your recommendations, which is what this whole event is about, Saison Yeast, would be to be as shallow as you can get the right profile with. You, you will have way finer esters. And this is something yeah. you want to find in, in those beers, especially if you ferment them, them at high temperature, because normally then you will have a lot of those higher alcohols. You need them. A beer without a higher alcohols is not, a, is not a beer, and you need them for making esters. So don't get me wrong. But I think that the beers with fair, a lot of higher alcohols uh, have zero drinkability, and you quickly get yeah. a headache. Um, and so you have to, to keep them at, that, at the right level. And so shape of fermenter and temperature with 
and your strain of yeast um, will be the three key things to, to, to monitor. So our next most popular question is from Guido, and I, and I hope, Guido, I have not slaughtered your name there, but it, but it certainly centers around something I've been hearing the whole time. So Guido's question is, as secondary fermentation seems to be very important for the beer character, is mm -hmm. secondary fermentation done in bottles at De La Sin? And do you separate this especially useful character, excuse me, this especially characterful yeast for this? Uh, that's a way of, of doing it. And, and I always consider uh, that, you know, when you look at a warm room for the second, secondary fermentation in bottle or, or kegs in, in, in our case too, um, it, it, it almost looks like a warehouse and, and, and you don't really pay attention of, of that. I consider that room, that basic room, being as important as, as, a, as a kettle or, or a tank in, in, in the brewery. Something very important uh, happens there and uh, the temperature control is something extremely important, the, the right timing, etc. etc. But so that's the way of, of doing that, that secondary fermentation that, that, that is very important. But you can also perform it in wooden barrels or even if you want in stainless steel. But I don't know many brewers having enough stainless steel tanks to perform that for that, that, that amount of time. Um, but but it, it, it could be it could be an option uh, for, for, for sure. So it can be or in the bottle and in the keg or in woods or in stainless. Just give it the, give it the time. And it can be the two of, of it. Um, wood and then re-fermentation in the bottle because there still some, something will, will happen. And I can tell you well, in my experience, when you blend a, a sour beer with a, with a more classic beer, once you put it in, in, in the bottle, it, it can undergo many, many strange fermentations. You can have all full of flavors. And so this is also something I, I learned from, from the old guys. If a beer that you bottled uh, seems to be bad, a, a failure, it's maybe the case, but give it a chance. Wait a little bit before stressing, before panicking. Uh, a few months, uh, sometimes more, but that, that's a little bit extreme. Um, come back to it. And, and if you are lucky, if Mother Nature was on your side, it, it might be very good, actually. I love that story. <laughs> it's always good to have a happy ending. And we're almost at the top of the hour, but I thought it, I'd pass along, Yvonne, uh, John Larson says right there in the contents uh, comments, thanks so much for your time, Yvonne. You too, Lars, really learned a lot today. So, uh, John, we appreciate you joining us as well as everybody else. We had a great crowd. I mean, look at over a thousand people tonight, and this is just fantastic. Oh, well, 12, 1,200, I'm sorry. <laughs> Not even looking at the number. Uh, it's really grown. So, uh, Yvonne, First of all, I know you've been going for 90 minutes. Actually, you've been going for two hours because we were all on 30 minutes uh, pre-show, and I know you were up late last night. Do you have a few more minutes to answer questions? Sure, yeah, no problem. Okay. We have 18 more questions, so, you mm -hmm. know, if we kept them about uh, two minutes apiece, we might could finish up in time or a little bit less. So can we do these rapid fire? Sure. No, no, no. Okay. Worries. Yeah. All right. So we'll try and keep these to a, about a, a minute or two each. So the first one comes from PJ. He says, What is the distinction between Saison and farmhouse? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> uh, you know, to be honest, farmhouse for, for, for me, well, it's not a style for me because it can be so, ma so many things. It's not a word that is coming from me for, for that for that book. Um, I think uh, there is it's it's a romantic name. Uh, in French, we would call that une image d'épinal. It was um, late nineteenth century drawings for kids made in in in, in eastern France, wh whatever, and it would try to explain something to kids on a very simple way, actually and. Um, it's useful 
it's useful because you you get some basic ideas that okay this is something different but it's also um sometimes a negative thing because then you got a lot of images that don't make sense anymore or that that are purely romantic um my thinking and i'm totally sure convinced of, of that but it's it's difficult to 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 to, to prove with written things is that if farmers means something made in a farm with raw materials that are mainly i say mainly grown by the farmer i'm totally 100 percent convinced that the saisons of Wallonia, which are different from saison de Liège, by the way for the ones who want to know nothing to do actually um that those beers were originally made in farms uh, it's obvious it it happens in 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 all the bring cultures we talk about scandinavia um the uk as well um had that so of course uh, you know in 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 belgium every place institution of a certain size of a certain importance um a school um a convent a hospital a farm a big mansion would have had a brewery from from the moment you have you had different people working for you and enough people it would it it was the good solution because it would cost you on the at the end of the year cheaper for making the beer for yourself and your people than buying it uh, elsewhere and then and, and also you were in the independent of course it was always a sort of a table beer uh, made there so very light every day's beer to to replace water the difference with saison is that um it was a beer that was meant to be kept for several months um brewed in the winter because it's the low season for 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 the farmers drunk in 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 the summer and so in the winter it was very useful to have that because you could give work to your uh, permanent work workers of course the big farms they work with a lot of seasonal workers but there's still some permanent workers including the the kids of, of the family for, for instance and so it, it gave them a, a very nice occupation in the, in the winter something with which you could save money if you grow your grains basically you have a, a simple grain equipment your beer cost you nothing um, and also it, it gave uh, some interesting food for the cattle especially during winter time again when there is no grass um, outside and so for all these reasons um, and, and we know and that that is recorded that um, a lot of um, breweries, especially in the know, not not only had a farm, and so of course they made uh, a beer to be kept uh, to to last for one season um, there. But of course, that's back in the days, and 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 at a certain point, the Boers farmers choose to either be only a farmer or become only a, a brewer, and it seems that that move started earlier than I thought. So somewhere in the mid 19th century i guess i i told honestly it was later um but uh after a while there was no no more farm making a, a, a beer and step by step those brewers they they didn't grow the um, the raw materials they would they would buy it but my point is there is a lot of romantic um feeling about something ma being made in a farm i think it's cool i love the idea i i, I love the idea of growing your stuff your, yourself i would never do it myself because it's, it's difficult enough for making a, a good beer uh, if you have to be a good farmer and growing hops on the top of that possibly but i'm, I'm totally capable of of, of managing do, do those different jobs to, to together i just mean by that that it's not because something is made in a farm with very simple equipment, raw materials that are in clumsy quality, that it's the best beer. So, so it's uh, it's nice, it's it's cool. It tells you a lot about your history and your culture, but it, it's not something that 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 will per se create the best beers. Uh, I, I think. And so saisons, I think they were famous beers. They are not no more. Does it mean that it that they have less value? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure it really answered the question, but um, we, we have to be aware of, of the romance or, 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 or things. Um, could could you simplify it, Yvonne, that essentially farmhouse more describes its origins and 
Saison is more of a specific style yeah, that exactly. could be made in a farmhouse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, let's say it's a start to simplify. As I said, for me, it's like a more family of beer with different yep. options. More, more options than for porter or oh, a broad style. A broad style, exactly. Um, but yes, yes, I, I think you summarized well what I think. Yeah. Okay. We that was PJ's question, and the next one. Who I don't. I'm going to try and pronounce this one. I need a beer. <laughs> yeah, my... there you must be dry. <laughs> <laughs> uh Cosmo. Gosh, I can't do that one. Anyway, uh, I'll I'll keep it short. Cosmo says. <laughs> What do you think of Lala Man's new hybrid saison style yeast? I have no idea because I I'm not using any um, yeast company yeasts, so I I've I simply don't know. I never used it, uh, and I no. I'm sorry. I would love to be able to answer, but I I can't. I have zero experience. I I don't exactly know what it is and why it's new either. I will check after on Google, but I have no clue. I have to be honest. With you. Kyle Summers wrote, he says the Lalaman farmhouse yeast is a hybridized non diastatic Saison strain. Oh, yeah, I heard about that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know the not flavor profile it gives. I don't know if it attenuates well. I would say this if it attenuates well, if if it's used for making a modern style saison, so post first world war, blah, blah, with only one yeast, um, it has to attenuate well, and I suppose it does. So, why 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 not? Mind of the the rustic character uh, for not making this beer like a Belgian blah 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 kind of other style. Uh, so I don't know the kind of flavors. Obviously, no, no, no phenols. But what kind of other flavors is is that beer uh, giving? If it's too clean, it re it resembles Belgian blonde, then then there is a problem. But I, I just don't know. It's just a guess. But if it's if it gives very clean flavors, like my house yeast does, by, by the way, um, try to to find some rusticity um, in using uh, more rustic grains. Rustic noble grains, I call them like spelt. I love spelt for making saison. It's for me the best grain for, for that. Wheat, uh, oats, rye, why, why, why not buckwheat or, or the local grain you have in your neighborhood, wherever you are on the, on the, on the, on the planet. Um, uh, old style hop varieties do the do job also if you can find some, some dirtiness uh, from, from, from them. Um, all, all this will work. I, I I like that. I, I've got to try one, so I'll I'll contact Lalamond about that one. That might might be worth doing. Thank you for that great question, uh, Hugo. And I can pronounce that one. <laughs> Thank you, Hugo. <laughs> How do classic saison breweries like Dupont, Blages, deal with the diastatica when bottle conditioning? Do they achieve the ideal level of carbonation? Do they prime very low and wait for the yeast to slowly reach that level? Personally, I've had saisons without Bretonmyces going from uh, 1003 at bottling to 0.998 after 12 months. Wow. Um, I think they do it with care and talent, uh, but I don't know exactly what. They are doing uh, again. I'm, I'm not choosing the, the the cheese. My thinking is that they go as far as they can for the the main fermentation. Uh, I don't think there is a, any other secret. You know, this is also helped um, when you can use different um, temperature uh, and and do step mashing. Um, but so yeah, create a highly fermentable wort and and don't, don't bottle too fast. And uh, measure your, of course, as, as you probably do your your gravity uh, carefully before bottling, and then make some cal calculations. Um, if you use that yeast very often, you will get to know her, 
um, which is as it should be uh, when you work with with, with, with with yeast, and you will know how far she can she can go, and then with some rule of terms, uh, you, you you will find your way uh, easily, I'm sure. But but check also the quality of your malt, and uh, and uh, and the temperatures, and and especially with global warming, um, the temperature of gelatinization of, of starch is, is is higher and higher. So don't. It, we, we cannot afford to get stick to, to just one mashing temperature now and never changing for four years because nature is changing because of us and we have to take that into account now. But I, the thing I like, it sounds like you're suggesting that while you might use a more, I hate to use the word industrialized, but anyway, a, a more defined yeast that may have less wild characteristics than something you might find yourself. Mm -hmm. That if you use some ingredients mm -hmm. like spelt and, and other yeah. characteristics, you can begin to get back that characteristic. Exactly. And I, that's very appealing to me because the yeast, I'd like something predictable. So that has a lot of appeal to me. <laughs> predictable, that's something we like. Problem is that it, it rarely happens, but, <laughs> but we like the idea. <laughs> Well, it, it's a good derivation. It's, this question's not posed here, but uh, I, I was talking to several people as I prepared for this event. And Levi Fried had a great comment uh, where he was talking about that in his yeasts, that he is using a yeast that he derived from his, I believe it was sourdough breads, Anyway, mm -hmm. it was for a bread yeast that he's using in his saisons, and he said it is doing fantastically well in sales. So, what do you think of a, a bread yeast in in a saison? I think the the way it does is absolutely beautiful, and I'm quite convinced without having any evidence. It's just something I think it, it makes sense to me. Uh, that uh, it has been used by by people uh, at home in farms, etc. Back in the days uh, when you don't brew for a certain period, you have to find back your yeast. There were there were they had many ways to keep the yeast. We can can talk about that. But uh, but sometimes they, they probably didn't have um, a good healthy yeast no more, and the neighbor also maybe so. In many instances, I'm, I'm sure that that very simple, extremely rustic technique have been used, and I think it's absolutely a great idea. Uh, now, um, ask myself the question: For in my understanding of making a bread liver, and and I know basically nothing about it, to be honest. But if you do that, I'm not sure that you can um, name that those yeast that you will get baker's yeast. Well, what what is telling you that it's exactly baker's yeast? Baker's yeast, which is a brewer's yeast that has been chosen with the time because it ferments less sugar, it gives enough CO two, blah blah blah, for some technical reason. So we still talk about originally brewer's yeast, by, by, by the way, but um, because it's it's spontaneously fermented, is it what we would call a, a baker's yeast? No, it, it, it's a, it's a yeast that is there in your surroundings. Uh, it's maybe not more baker's yeast that that the brewer's yeast or, or another yeast. So why wouldn't the why wouldn't it work? Uh, I, 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 I mean, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a really great great idea. Uh, and 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 if the the result is good to drink and people like it, it's 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 absolutely great. I, I just want because I for, forget I, I just saw passing a, 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 a question with a lot of. Uh, Points where where were the farms after World War II? Uh, we had many farms, but they were not making beer anymore. If that is the question, the the um, the the moment when the farm breweries became either pure farm or pure breweries that happened before World War II, uh, as 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 a sure thing. And 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 I think that that that's ancient brewers having me having told that to me but between the two wars there were there were maybe one or two farms doing both but it, it was the exception it was the total exception and so that change that move uh, in into speci specialization of, of your job that happened way back in the 19th century for for, for sure
So after the World War II, in my knowledge, no farm was still green. So Lars, did you have a comment on the sourdough starter as a saison yeast? Say that again. I'm sorry. Uh, did you have a co on, on comment on this? Oh, yeah. yeah. But but, so, um, but say, yeah, saison yeast again. Well, well, what it is? I'm sure you can make a wonderful saison with, with a sourdough yeast. But but sorry, Lars. Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, it was it was more the the issue of using sourdough yeast in in beer in general. So there was um, there were a few genetic studies of, of bread yeast that showed that uh, there's two kinds essentially. I'm simplifying a little. So one is uh, the type that's found in sourdough, and the other type is what's sold as commercial baker's yeast. Uh, and what we said. Uh, seems to be right from the genetic studies that the commercial baker's yeast mostly mixes in with bread yeast uh, and with beer yeast, sorry. Um, but the pure sourdough yeasts are interesting because they um, seem to be distinct and a lot of them seem to be domesticated in the sense that they have adapted to uh, fermenting uh, bread. And there was there was even one study this year or last year that showed that uh, using uh, sourdough yeast works fairly well in in beer. And if you look at the the ethnographic literature, like in Norway, people say the best was was beer yeast, which of course they had a lot of because you know they were making beer. Um, but you could also use sourdough uh, yeast for beer, but it wasn't as good. But then the really strange thing, <laughs> the really bizarre thing is uh, Swedish brewers uh, who have this tradition of, for some reason, on Midsummer's Day to create beer yeast out of just flour and water. And they're really superstitious about the water. It had to be a uh, north flowing, flowing streams. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. Uh, and then this was mixed with rye flour. Uh, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's impossible to say why or what they got out of it because the whole brewing tradition is dead and, and nobody remembers it anymore. But th there is still this. Uh, documentary record of them making beer yeast this way. Uh, and I really wish I knew what it meant. I don't. Interesting. Well, I mean, what I like about it, though, is that the, this can work. And clearly, uh, Levi says they're flying off the shelves. So <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> Sales is good. <laughs> mm, great. All right, so we have a little less than uh, 15 minutes, probably 13 minutes and 15 questions. So we really are going to have to zing through these about a, less than a minute apiece if we can. So Frank Christian asks, what are good and historically correct primary sources for research into Belgian saisons and where can we find them? Actually, and... Um... I, I explained that in, in the chapter I, I, I wrote in, in Facebook. Uh, they are known. <laughs> they are, they, there is no monography on, on the saison we talk about. Let's call them Molonian saison. So we still have to find a good name for that. Uh, that exists. There is a monography written in 1909 on saison, but that is saison de Liège. It's an urban style, totally different than the Saison de Wallonie, the keeping beers we were talking about tonight uh, the, the, with a very low attenuation, um, a specific recipe and specific yeast. For that style, you, you really have real guidelines through the ages with, with some nuances at some point. The, it's, it's very, very, very well documented. And, and it's tricky because it's called Saison, something Saison de Liège. Liège is, is, a, is an important city in uh, southeast um, Belgium. So maybe someday, I forgot the name of the 
um, auditor, you will see a treatise on saison. It's not the saison we are talking about. So there is, there exists zero treatise. Um, when you do some research on saison, you need to understand the techniques that were used, and therefore you have to look on Bière de Garde in the treatises. But it's tricky because Bière de Garde, there were plenty of Bière de Garde in, in, in Belgium. So, but, but, but you realize that the way of making them, when the breweries professionalized at least, were basically the same at the guidelines given by the scholars, uh, all, all went in, in, the, in the same direction. So there are very, very few mentions of saison, saison de Wallonie, wa, wa, whatever, in, in the books. It's, it's all on Bière de Garde. And even though it's, it's bits and pieces, it's here and there a sentence. Uh, wh wh one of the, 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 the most interesting article I have done on the subject uh, is in a scientific art article from, from 1946, I, I mentioned uh, earlier. Um, in that article, the name Saison, Saison du Eno, Saison de Wallonie, is mentioned three times. It's the one that compares the Saison to the Goose, actually the Goose to the, to, to the Saison. Um, it's extremely rare to, to, to find out. And I, I, I so this is you. why it's taken 20 years for I'm you sorry? to figure out. It's, there's just not there. <laughs> uh, uh, no, no, uh, of, of course. There, and, and, and there is a reason for, for, for that that I also s s said many times. It's the, the books, they were written by scholars. The scholars, they mainly lived in cities and they wrote about what they knew and what was already documented. Nobody really cared about the beer made made in in, in the countryside. Yeah. Uh, really, they did they, they didn't care. A lot of brewers didn't even know it existed. It's it's all the city beers. You have a lot of documentation, everything you want, but the countryside beers, except except for the grisette, there is one small treaty on on the grisette, and and there is the, the, there is in, in different journals quite quite a, quite interesting material. But for the saisons, countryside style nothing almost so it's really bits and pieces it's it's like a gigantic puzzle and let's say it's a 10,000 pieces puzzle and 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 we might have i'm saying something 150 pieces and 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 the rest we have to be guessing making links between things and and finding what makes sense but one very important thing and 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 i really dislike when when people dismiss that source is um what the the ancient people do people were, were seeing and I had the chance and, and, and most of them are sadly dead now since but I had the chance to still interview people who, who have known and, and who have listened things from from their father and their grandfather etc they, they had the, the age of, of my grandfather uh, basically so it's two generations older than me and I'm not that young so it, it could go back to a certain time and um and, and everything those people told me goes in the same direction uh, of, of what I found, the bits and pieces I found, I found in books. But don't, don't dream about um, a, a treatise on, on, on Saison de Hainaut, Saison de Wallonie. Uh, I know all the books that have been published. Uh, I have a lot of them and it simply don't exist. Um, yeah. And it will be a frustration forever, but it's, it's like that. So Frank, listen to Yvonne. He'll save you twenty years of research, <laughs> <laughs> and, and more because I, I will continue all, all my life because I think it's really fascinating. It's it, it's uh, yeah, it's 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 like being uh, I don't know you 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 have, you have to, to to find a solution of a of a case. Um, yeah, it's like cold case, you know, <laughs> but so, uh, but, so. but it's, it's 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 very difficult, but it makes it fascinating. I, Yvonne, I, I do have a hard stop at the bottom of the hour. It, it, mm -hmm. they, it, they will literally pull the plug. So it won't be very uh, gracious if we don't kind of hurry. So uh, Johan asks another question. We need quick answers. Uh, what do you think about the concept of rustic, sometimes used to describe saisons? Does it mean something at all in today's beers? As, as I told earlier, it's the most, I, I think it's a key for, for the port style that Saison is, and the most difficult uh, to understand and, and to communicate to, to, to someone else. What is rustic for me? What is rustic for, for you? 
again, I, I told a lot about that and I don't have like a proper definition. Rustic, it, it's something related to the countryside, if you read the, the dictionary, but well, it doesn't tell much. Um, I would say something, uh, again, that is not too clean. Um, because otherwise you take uh, the criteria, uh, light, refreshing, well attenuated, blah, 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 it can be many other beers. It, it will not make those beers be, being a proper saison. That, that rusticity, that, that, sim that simplicity uh, and that absence of, of cleanliness of something that is totally mastered um, is part of, of the definition. But I, I'm sorry to say that it's very difficult to translate. Well, into something. I, I would relate it. I'm an engineer. So I yeah. think things that are very repeatable are definitely not rustic. Things that have a certain amount of variability in the process would be certainly more rustic and crafty and artistic. It's true. And at the same time, we brewers, it's our motto. We want the things to be replicable <laughs> and, and we, we work hard for, for, for that. So, yeah, it's a, you are right saying that. But at the same time, don't tell the guys at, 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 at Dupont that uh, they don't replicate the, 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 the beer. I, I think the rusticity in, in, in their beers come from the, the phenols, the strong phenols. Right. Um, more than the, an well, absence of replicability because they make very constant beers. So. Well, I hope we'll get a chance to ask Olivier that question. Mm. That should be coming up soon. Mm. Uh, yeah. We've got about three minutes left. And let's see, the, I'm trying to find the highest voted question. It looks like uh, Francisco's has that question. So we've still got to be quick. We've only got a minute or two. So making Saison takes time. Can you explain the chemical mechanisms to us during its maturation? Interaction between Brett and Saccharomyces, transformations of aromatic molecules and bitterness. What do you think? <laughs> in, in, in what in two minutes <laughs> that's, I'm sorry that's that's totally I, 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 impossible um, it, it's 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 a it's a classic bread fermentation and and of course um, it, it many many things will, will depend on how far uh, you will have been with the, the primary fermentation I mean how attenuated your first beer is uh, myself I, I like the, the primary fermentation to go quite 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 far, um, and then yeah, it's uh, it's it's microbiology, and um, it, it, in two minutes I will not even start. Uh, the thing I can I can tell with bitterness, and that refers um, to a study I think made uh, like a decade ago by Goose Island actually uh, about the, the the bitterness in in aging. Um, I read often that bitterness decreases linearly with, with aging. And those guys showed something that I saw in, in beer. It's that it's not exactly true. It will first start to decline and then it will reach uh, a plateau, we would say in French, that, that uh, a level that it, that, that it will keep. And that's interesting um, about that character I explained that the saison, according to, to some real scientists, uh, could be compared to those with more bitterness. Um, it was heavily helped, and, and, and a part of that bitterness would stay in, in the beer, it seems. It would reach that level where, where it stops decreasing. Um, that, 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 that's an, an interesting part for, for me. Because otherwise, you can say, well, a beer is a saison. It's from the well, same very broad family. It's a keeping beer, but, but made differently and, with, and for different purposes. And, um, Yvonne, uh, we just have seconds left, and is right. and I don't control when this ends. It, they literally, yeah. like I said, pull the plug. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to thank you. Uh, I mean, this was just fantastic. I mean, it really, I had high expectations, especially after what Phil said. But you have exceeded them all, and, and I almost feel like we need to come back to secondary fermentation, because that in itself, I think, could be a great discussion. So we're literally seconds away. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you joining. It was fantastic. Uh, Lars, thank you for being there. Yvonne, thank you for being there. 